Hi, Mark. Hey. Can you hear me? Hello, Hi. can you hear me? I can't Hello? hear you. Hold on. I'm just checking because I can't hear you now. Just wait a minute. <clears throat> um, okay. It shows that my mic's working. Oh, okay. There you are. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Good afternoon. All August. right. How are you? Yeah, just fine. Nice how are you? Good, good. <laughs> Everything fine over here, so pretty relaxing. Um, hold on. Let me just get all this out of the way here so that I don't get like a million calls in between. So, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, you know, it took a little while to um, schedule with all your... Um, um, routine. Um, I hope uh, that you have plenty of time today. <laughs> yeah, define plenty. <laughs> How long do uh, you think you want to go for? Like approximately? Well, certainly not uh, above two hours, but um, I mean, we can wrap it up in an hour if you want. Well, let's just see how it goes. Okay. And um, hold on, let me just turn off. Ah, okay, hold on. So whenever you're ready, I can just um, share the live stream on Facebook. Yeah, give me a few minutes because um, I might, I'm just checking that. Ah, okay. Sure, I'll just run and do something quick also. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, yeah, I think. Go? Yeah, should be good to go. All right. Let me out here. Uh, just to give you a heads up, um, sometimes we do have power cut. These days we don't have that that often, but if in that unique case that it does happen, um, I'm still here. So um, I think my video would go off, um, but other than that, I'm still here. So um, just to okay. you know, let you know <clears throat> that happens. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. The um, could happen here too. It's uh, <laughs> really yeah. Where are you at the moment? Are you in German? Yeah, it's actually um, in residential areas. It's actually not that great, depending on where you live. Um, okay. But um, at, at university, it's perfect, of course. Yeah, but not here. So I'm, I'm home All office right. now. Okay. So. All right. Let me see if everything's working fine.
<clears throat> are we on yet or uh, no, I'm just setting some settings, you know, filling in the um, information for um, the name and everything. Small right. things. Oh, don't worry. I'll just, I'll give you an heads up. <laughs> don't worry. Right. So I just, um, just someone to ask, uh, what about your company? Sido, is that right? Yes, that's how it's spelled. So it's an um, acronym for psychometric data analysis. Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Uh, all good. I'm just about to hit the button. <laughs> okay. All right. You can share that, by the way, um, to your page if you want. Yeah, no, hold on. Let me try to do that. All right, we're live. Okay. Also checking, hold on. Oh, there we are. Okay. All right, thank you so much for being with us, um, Dr. Marco. My name is Minhaj, and I'm the CEO of a company called Sida, which is an AI-enabled data-driven research and industrial um, services company. Um, we have today Dr. Marco Sarsted, one of the most uh, awaited interview um, that many are expecting uh, for a month now. Um, we're so thankful for uh, Marco for being here. Uh, Marco Sarsted um, is a chair professor of marketing at Otto von Guerck University in Magdeburg. His research focuses on consumer behavior, psychometrics, structural equation modeling with special emphasis on partial least care. His research has been published in world's most renowned journals like Nature Human Behavior, Psychometrica, MIS Quarterly, and Journal of Marketing Research. His research repeatedly ranked in Shugan's list of top 20 mo most cited marketing articles. He was listed among the most cited researchers across all scientific disciplines, long-term and short-term, according to Ionides et al. in 2019. A standardized citations metrics author database annotated for scientific field uh, in PLOS biology. Um, he also was listed as highly influential uh, author. Um, he also won the Emerald Literary Network Award for Excellence um, and also the Bex, uh, Best Textbook Award among many. Um, he also uh, received awards from German Academic Association for Business Research. Um, he's also been listed as a member of the Clarivate Analytics highly cited researcher list um, for numerous years. Um, this list recognizes world class researchers selected for their exceptional research performance demonstrated by production of multiple highly cited papers that rank in the top 1% by citation for field and year in the web of science. His book um, is um, a home. Um, entity these days, a primer on partial least care structural equation modeling is one of the most popular books on the topic um, he wrote along with Dr. Ringel and Joseph Heer. Uh, the book has been translated in Arabic, German, Persian, and Spanish and is in progress uh, to be translated in French, Italian, and Portuguese. Um, he holds the board memberships for Journal of Business Economics as area editor since 2019. Um, also in Behavior Metrica since 2018. He is also the editorial board member for Journal of Marketing Analytics since 2018. And um, he's also a editorial advisory board member for Journal of Applied Structural Equation Modeling, as well as uh, numerous others like Journal of Cooperative Organization and Management, International Journal of Advertising, International Journal of Market Research. Dr. Marco received his habilitation in 2012 from 
Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany, uh, with a thesis on essays on market-based management, methodological advances, and developments in mar managing market-based assets. In 2008, he received his doctorate in business administration from LMU Munich also, um, and his thesis on, was on selected contributions to market-based management. He um, has been an adjunct professor since 2018 in Monash uh, University, Malaysia, um, as well as um, he has also served as adjunct professor at the University of Newcastle, Australia since 2011 to 2018. He has been assistant professor for quali qualitative methods in marketing and management as a junior professor at LMU since 2010 uh, to 2012. Um, he has been visiting professor in many universities around the world, including University of Technology, Sydney, Villanova School of Business, Philadelphia, US, and um, a lot of other universities around the world. He completed his postdoc uh, from 2008 to 2010 at LMU also. Um, he has taught numerous undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate programs over the years and, and has presented in countless conferences, workshops, and seminars. Not only is he a world-class academic, he has received many grants and research funds for industrial research with companies like Volkswagen, uh, Lufthansa, and State Chancery of Section and Halt. He was also part of the team that optimized the Hugo Boss direct mail advertisement. Um, and the list goes on and on and on, and we wouldn't have to have an interview if I completed just that. So with that, very warm welcome to Dr. Um, Marco Sharstedt. Thank you so much for being here, Doctor. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind <laughs> introduction, yeah. <laughs> uh, doctor, um, it's been an illustrious work um, that we have gone over uh, in the introduction uh, from your past. Tell us something that we don't know about your research, your current work and uh, what you're going to be doing. Something that you don't know about my work currently? Or... Yes, that we haven't covered in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, regarding my work, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm um, known for my work on, on PLS, right? I mean, uh, this is certainly when you count just the number of publications that are dealing with uh, PLS, that's certainly the number one. Um, but that's actually not, not fully accurate. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a bias uh, because I'm actually also a consumer researcher. So I'm, I'm a chair of marketing and I'm actually teaching like marketing principles and marketing management and consumer behavior and all these different things. And for a good reason, because I actually also do research and marketing. Yeah? So, and actually quite a bit and increasingly so. Um, specifically about consumer behavior, choice inconsistencies in consumer behavior. Lots of research currently done on, on sensory research, which is really exciting, I think, like uh, scent. Yeah? So how does ambient scent impact our decision making and how does it actually lead to irrational choice behavior? So that's uh, actually something that I, <laughs> I do quite a bit. Um, but obviously there's a bit of a of a bias because uh, that work is not so visible compared to what we do in PLS. Yeah, because PLS is just something that many disciplines can use. You can use it in, in the social sciences. It's been used now in just so a, um, a paper in Nature, Geoscience using the methods. Um, it's been increasingly been used in um, the hard sciences like in engineering, medicine. And so that's where the citations come from, and that's probably where the, the impact comes from. Yeah? So our work on, on ambient scent and choice uh, inconsistencies are well, for, for a very specific audience, but it's actually interesting for the practitioners because they don't care that much about PLS, like the theory behind the method. Yeah? They use it, but not so much like the things that we deal with, like energy assessment and invariance assessment. I mean, that's just more for academic purposes, I guess. Um, very interesting. Um, when I first contacted you, um, I think the impetus uh, for this urge was coming from the fact that you're not only um, dealing with deep methodological issues like um, PLS and the everlasting battle between CB-SEM and PLS-SEM that we're going to be talking about later today, but also the multifaceted research um, that you have done. You have also worked with industry, uh, with different companies, 
um, that actually gives a practical approach to your um, research success. Um, to, to kick off uh, some of the um, methodological issues that we're going to be talking today, um, path analysis, um, if we look into the quantitative methodology, um, can be deemed as an early player um, in the multivariate analysis. Um, SEM, um, both CB um, and PLS uh, have come up um, to attention um, very recently. So as a proof, fewer than 10 articles using SEM were published in marketing journals prior to 1990, while more than two thirds of all the articles applying SEM appeared between 1995 and 2017. Um, that's from one of the papers um, by Joseph here in 2008. Your book, uh, A Primer on Partial Least Square Structural Equation Modeling, um, is one of the most cited books in the history of top cited um, papers and or books on the topic. Um, it has 15,828 citations so far. And I personally thoroughly enjoyed reading that book because I was expecting it as uh, one of the those books written by statisticians that um, no one's supposed to understand but themselves. Um, but it was a thorough, um, a ple pleasant read to actually um, have that book. It's been translated in many languages. What do you think is the reason behind the popularity of PLS SEM, um, especially when it is a very late comer uh, to the competition? Mm. Um, well, one of the reasons why PLS is so popular is I think because it's primarily it's easy to use. Yeah, that's a, certainly a point to it, which uh, many statisticians won't take as a good argument. Um, and there's certainly a point to that. Um, but generally, I think um, with CBSEM, like covariance-based SEM, uh, many researchers are struggling with this for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons being that the requirements that the method imposes upon your research is actually pretty uh, severe and pretty rigid, right? Um, so I don't want to get too much into this PLS versus CBSEM debate now, but as you ask, um, so one problem that I've always seen with covariance-based SEM is that because of these strict requirements, especially in terms of getting your model identified and get like a decent level of statistical power, you need either to have a very small model or many observations. And that's simply in, in social science research, sometimes really challenging because the populations of interest are so small. Yeah? Consider business to business marketing, for example, where you can be happy about a sample size of a few hundred. Yeah? And in, in such settings, getting your covariance based SEM model up to speed is not impossible, but it's very challenging. So what, what do people do? I mean, um, obviously they try to reduce the model complexity, they impose constraints and all these things. Yeah? And they don't do this because the theory suggests that this is the right thing to do, but they do it because the method requires them to do so. And I think that's not a very good scientific practice. I mean, there's always a trade-off between having, uh, like being sufficiently complex in, in understanding some phenomenon, being generalizable, and also meet the demands on, of the method. Yeah? But in my point of view, doing several workshops on CBSEM and attending numerous workshops on that topic, I thought, come on, what type of scientific conduct is this? Um, people are having great ideas, fantastic structural theory, and then they come up with the, the model and they reduce it to like a manageable small size only because the method forces them to do so. Yeah? And I think this is an important uh, point in, uh, in PLS because it allows you to, to look into very complex models without uh, identification concerns. This is also a potential problem, obviously, yeah, because a, a larger model is not necessarily a good model, quite the opposite, actually. Uh, small models are parsimonious, they're generalized to other settings, but where does parsimony start? It depends on the phenomenon. And then uh, there I see a bit of a problem with CBSAM. Um, Second point, just real quick, it's the, the causal predictive nature of PLS. This is something that is increasingly being um, emphasized in, in very recent research. Yeah? So CBSAM follows a strict theory testing paradigm, yeah? so the way the algorithm runs and so on. And there's merit to that. Yeah? But the thing is, in, in the social sciences, especially in business research, 
we want to make recommendations. So actionable recommendations to practitioners. And these are always predictive statements. So when we have a managerial implication section, there's a statement like, um, uh, the company, our results show that companies should do this and that. And uh, if you say a company should do this and that, that's a predictive statement, yeah? because then you imply that if something, if the company does something now, something will happen in the future. Yeah? And um, this, like CBSM does not allow, strictly does not allow for making such statement because the method is purely confirmatory. Yeah? There are ways of getting like scores in, in covariance based SEM that you can predict. There's also Bayesian SEM, which is uh, uh, supported in that regard, but that imposes even higher requirements on the data. So I think PLS is simply practical. It allows us to explore phenomena which other methods can do. And I um, think the, the causal predictive nature, that's really a distinguishing feature. Mm. Um, very interesting. And I think um, this needs um, um, further um, follow-ups that we're going to be doing later down on the interview. But for now, um, you, I believe, um, are also one of the um, founding architects of Smart PLS3 software, along with Dr. Ringel, who helped with algorithms. Um, and um, it has become a standard for uh, Smart, uh, for PLS SEM research. Um, these days, a lot of studies coming out from them. Uh, if you could just briefly tell uh, about how it approaches PLS and how it actually helps, um, that, that'd be great uh, so that we could, you know, build our um, questioning from here. So, okay, you were gone for a second. Can you repeat the question? Sure. I mean, if you could just explain us about uh, your role in Smart yeah. PLS3, okay. what it does and how mm -hmm. it helps. All right. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, I'm not officially part of the Smart PLS team, neither is Joe Hare, right? Um, so that's actually something that Christian Ringer does uh, with Jan Michael Becker and uh, Sven Wende, who's a programmer behind all this. And they founded this, like two of them founded it uh, in 2004, I think. And uh, my, Jan Michael joined a couple of years ago. So I'm not officially part of the, the Smart PLS um, software team, nevertheless. I'm obviously very involved in this um, uh, because um, we develop new algorithms. We try to come up with methodological solutions to, um, to problems that every user faces using Smart PLS or any other software. And uh, we design the algorithms which are then being implemented in software. Uh, so this is one role that I have. And the other role that I have is certainly uh, popularize it because we um, we have numerous like the book for example we have uh, guideline articles uh, by the way regarding the book uh, really literally 10 minutes before we started here I was writing on the third edition so this will come out next year uh, oh, nice. um, so uh, look it's something to look forward to for sure <laughs> and sorry to cut you short but I believe that you also have smart PLS 4 coming out uh, yeah, that's in the making. Um, that's in the making. Kristen showed like a sneak preview of this and um, see the one of the most challenging things having like a canned software like like smart PLS is that it is up to current standards, for example, in the Java engine, which is underlying this. Yeah? And this is really most of the work that happens in the background, which you like the users don't see really. Yeah? So there's constant uh, developing uh, going on to match the requirements of, for example, new Java engines. And if you don't do that, like really updating this regularly, first, you might run into security risks. Second, just might cease working at some point. Yeah? So, um, and uh, Smart PLS 4 um, caters this need. And there's also gonna be some new algorithms in there, but um, I'm not sure which one Christian will end up implementing. So there are many choices, yeah, including even covariance based SEM, but uh, I'm not sure whether this is gonna be part of it. Okay. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, other implementations that we could talk about um, in Smart PLS3, for example, the only um, 100 cases limitation for free version and um, um, the pricing itself, but I guess that's for Dr. Ringel to address. Uh, uh, to talk a little bit about the predictive abilities that you have um, talked about um, of Smart PLS3 or PLS as a method in general. Um, we at CIDA do a lot of work in machine learning and predictive abilities of high-performing computing infrastructure. 
Um, so I've recently talked uh, with um, Dr. Somia that you have worked with also, um, and he has done some uh, fabulous work in terms of PLS Predict. Um, where do you think that PLS Predict stands against the powerful algorithms like uh, support vector machines and random forest, uh, focusing especially on PLS? Um, I don't know what is in the plan. Are you going to include the CBM or not? Uh, but um, if you do, how does it actually match with the more computer science um, mm-hmm. contemporary of that, which is um, the machine learning algorithm and possibly neural networks? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question <laughs> because it's really something that we've been uh, thinking about uh, a lot recently. Um, so when you when you take like pure machine learning approach, yeah, then this is what we call in stats a kitchen sink approach. Uh, so you have a uh, a set of variables, you have some outcome, and you select the variables purely based on their ability to predict the outcome. So prediction then takes place using some type of cross-validation or holdout sampling. And the entire model, uh, model selection, as we call it, so the, the variable selection is based on this goal. Yeah? And oftentimes um, in artificial intelligence, it's really unclear how the algorithm ended up with this solution. Um, it's a black box, yeah? it's intransparent. And um, this is not an issue in my point of view. And there's like a bus so making to understand how these algorithms work. So how did the algorithm get to that solution? But at the end of the day, it's as, as theoretical. Yeah. So even if you can explain the process, it's as theoretical. So the theory does not matter. Yeah. So there's there are people like Chris Anderson, yeah, former editor of Wired magazine, who argues it's the end of theory. Like uh, if you have machine learning, then there's no need for theory anymore because you can measure everything like in a blink of an eye, and then you can adjust the model. Uh, in a nanosecond and change it, yeah. Uh, but I think um, this is first off very unscientific because we live in a noisy world and it's especially that noisiness that calls into question the purely data-driven approach. And actually whoever argued against that, I think the Corona COVID crisis showed us that pretty nicely because what happened to all those supermarkets that had machine learning algorithms to optimize their supply chains, they had to have manual interventions because the, uh, the purchasing behavior of the, of the consumers was totally running out of bounds. Everyone, at least in Germany, bought like toilet paper, like help <laughs> over here, because it was a way of people feeling safe again. Yeah, so I have stock up on toilet paper. So it's, there's some consumer research on why this has happened. But anyway, the point is the, this consumer behavior um, let all the machine learning models collapse. And um, see, I don't, I'm not saying that a, a PLS model would have done a better job here, but it helped us at least understand the theory behind consumer behavior. Yeah? And so we need to understand why these things happen. Prediction is it's a great thing to, to guide us to into- important phenomena and suggest ways of how these phenomena actually function. But at the end of the day, as scientists, our role is to, to have a theory and explain the exact like causal mechanisms, how A leads to B leads to C. And so I think there's, there's room for a technique like PLS, which is predictive on the one hand. So it basically follows the same paradigm as machine learning. But at the same time, it has this pre-specified model that you're actually testing. And uh, so I think it, it takes the best of both worlds. It takes prediction focus with lots of data, and then you have a, a theory focus, which you have had with covariance based SCM. So I think that's where the value added of PLS actually comes in. Um, I think one question from within your answer um, surprisingly comes from the very criticism um, that. Um, a lot of people level at uh, certain approaches. Um, I, for one, am certainly in your camp that um, data itself does not answer um, anything if there is no solid theory behind that. Uh, But this is exactly the criticism for Smart PLS3 also, that you have given tools in the hand of people who might not be totally equipped with explaining the models that they're doing. Um, I remember one of the papers um, by Dr. Ringel itself, I cannot seem to um, remember the exact name, Um, actually the meta-analysis on um, the... um, all, all the papers that used PLS and they found out significant methodological issues um, 
in the results. Um, and I think as much as its popularity um, is a good thing for PLS, I'm not too sure about if it's applied um, in a correct sense. For example, if people who cannot code in R um, or in Python um, are using Smart PLS3 as a click and, and drop software, um, what do you think, um, are, are they in, equipped um, enough um, to be able to explain the results of uh, Smart PLS3 any better than they are able to do the results for R and Python? <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's difficult to say, yeah, because it depends on the individual. Uh, but generally, I don't think um, being able to program in matrix language is a requirement for for anybody to be a good, good be good at theory. Yeah? And but to be able to explain the results is surely is one, no? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, um, the thing with with software like Smart PLS is um, it's easy to use. And while we accept this as a valid um, argument in consumer, like in consumer everyday life, like my, here, my smartphone, for example, yeah, that's easy to use. Um, and everyone expects this to be easy to use. When it comes to statistical software, some researchers criticize that it's too easy to use. Yeah? I don't quite follow that argument. Why, why does a software have to be complicated to, to be like, uh, high utility for researchers? So I, I don't get it. Yeah? Um, the thing is, it's in the reviewer's role um, to tell nonsense from actually useful models. And the software is not, uh, it's nothing that, um, um, that plays a role there in my point of view. It's actually quite the opposite. And I can say, give you actually a really recent example. I was given a, a workshop a while ago and um, one of the nicest feedbacks that I ever received after the workshop was uh, a participant that came up and said, well, you came here a couple of years ago and showed us how to use Smart PLS. And ever since then, people have gained confidence in, in their research and not only like software, but in g research in general, because when I came to that university, there was very little research going on. There were some that were involved, so it wasn't bad, uh, but it wasn't great either. And when I came like now, there were like dozens of people working, actively working on their research projects. And one of the participants said that, that not only your, your thing, yeah, but it was, Partly because you came and you showed the software and the people used it and saw, okay, if I have data and I do something, then something happens and it gave them confidence. So I think software can be a facilitator and Smart PLS is a facilitator for many researchers. Yeah? So to, to get their research out there, I think that's uh, one of the biggest achievements by the Smart PLS team. Mm. Um, well, while I do agree the fact that, you know, you have certainly given research a lot of impetus and I've seen um, developing countries do a lot of research with smart PLS3 like Malaysia and Indonesia and people springing from India and Pakistan. Um, I'm not too sold out on the fact that they're always used uh, with a solid theoretical foundation, but we can, you know, put that down um, along with other questions um, that I've lined up for you, but for now. Uh, Let's give your critics some of the airtime that um, supposed to be for you because you know it's got to be a balanced um, show here. Now, uh, the paper um, by uh, Mitra Ronko, uh, critical examination of common beliefs about partial least squares path modeling, um, says. On close examination, some of those beliefs prove to be unfounded and to bear little correspondence to the actual capabilities of PLS. In this article, we critically examined several, several of these commonly held beliefs. We described their origins and using simple examples, we demonstrate that many of these beliefs are not true. We conclude that the method is widely misunderstood and our results cast strong doubt on its effectiveness for building and testing theory in organizational research. You call this paper a polemic. Uh, on some other uh, forums, you have also mentioned that PLS um, and CB does not yield um, dramatically different results if you have strong uh, and correct uh, models and enough sample size. What does uh, Ronko not know that you do? <laughs> the point is, maybe he's listening now, yeah. The point is, he knows exactly what I know, yeah. Um, and um, that's what 
is a bit disconcerting uh, regarding the this paper. Because um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail in the technical details of this paper, yeah. But you can let any method fail, any method, yeah. And that even a simple regression analysis, you can let it fail, yeah. If you want it to fail, then you can do this, and that's exactly what what these authors did. And I don't, I'm not saying that there's not merit to that, yeah. So I think it's very good to understand boundary conditions under which methods work and don't work, yeah. And I think they have done a nice point, a uh, nice job in pinpointing several situations when PLS does not work. For example, um, they have shown without actually, I think, wanting it, that one of the most popular criteria for um, discriminant validity assessment for Nelarco does not work. And that triggered actually some follow up research um, by your counselor, um, Christian Ringland, and I, where we developed the HDMT criterion. That was actually a result of. Uh, Rönke's uh, criticism, yeah? and uh, so I I appreciate that. That's great. Yeah? But there are two things to this. Yeah, you can generalize from from very specific setting. Let me give you an example. Like what these authors did was they considered a two construct model, yeah? and these two constructs had a zero relationship. And they showed that if this is the case, bootstrapping will not have unimodal distribution. So it will be bimodal like this, yeah? which violates the fundamental assumption of the, the um, inference setting in PLS. Because we assume that the data are, or the bootstrap distribution is approximately normally distributed, and then we compute the standard error and calculate T and P values and confidence intervals and all that stuff. Yeah? And they have shown that there's a condition where this is not the case. Yeah? Two constructs being linked with a zero relationship. And based on this conclusion, or this finding, they say PLS must not use, be used for null hypothesis significance testing. This is so misput that it's really difficult for me to, to, uh, to, be, uh, like, <laughs> to see any valid argument for such a statement because the second you change this relationship to 0 0.0001, or you add another construct into the model, which has a non-zero relationship, this bimodal changes into unimodal again. So this is a very, very, very specific case, a two construct model with a zero relationship, which is never gonna be relevant in practice. So I don't see how you can generalize from such a specific instance to uh, general use of a method in across a, a discipline. That's why we call it a polemic, because it, it generalizes settings which are not generalizable in our point of view. Yeah. Having said that, however, there's lots of value to to the paper because they pinpointed other situations like lack of goodness of fit testing. Um, I think clarifying whether it's an exploratory tool or not. I think there was a fair argument to some of these points. And I mean, at the end of the day. It triggers follow-up research, which is highly impactful, like the HGMT criterion. Consistent PLS was also results from this. So yeah, I think uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. So I, I like a good scientific debate. Yeah. Um, but it should be um, it should be uh, objective, and um, it should not attack individual researchers. It's also something that happened in the past, which I don't appreciate. Um, oh, fair enough. Now, one of the taglines that I really like in one of your papers is that it's CB SEM and PLS SEM, not CB SEM or PLS SEM, uh, which you seem to think that um, actually help each other and they're not mutually exclusive. Now, the question your critics actually do ask um, from uh, a lot of researchers that have um, collaborated with you is, that why PLS SEM at all? Because uh, if that they have fairly equal results um, with good measurement models and uh, good enough sample size, um, they yield the same results. So why PLS SEM in the first place? Now, on a lighter note, um, some would argue that um, PLS SEM, um, what PLS SEM lacks in rigor is made up by the charm that you possess in socializing you as a marketing professor 
ma have mastered um, is probably uh, one of the reasons of its um, relative popularity. I mean, you are very well accepted. You have taught around the world, and you know, uh, it's more of a political battle that you have won than the <laughs> rigor of the uh, method itself. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's it's the first time I hear that argument, but anyway, uh, I don't perceive myself being such a charm that <laughs> my my opinion would. Um, would be able to uh, position a method like this, uh, despite um, it, like even if, if it was like totally inferior, that my person or Christian or anyone else could position it in such a way that uh, people would rather think, oh, if this person uses it, so let's forget about all the um, all the uh, problems of the method. But anyway, um, yeah, of, I mean, of, obviously there is room to that, as I said um, in the, in the beginning. Yeah, so CBSEM really uh, is, a, is a great workhorse for uh, consumer research and psychology and so on. But at the end of the day, um, the, the lack of seeing complex models and having a more holistic understanding of phenomena is partly due to CBSEM's limitations. Yeah? So this is something that you can't argue away despite all the um, uh, conceptual differences that I might have with the critics regarding the nature of measurement. And I mean, there's good arguments where I think, yeah, you know, that's a viewpoint which I can accept. I've got a different viewpoint and so on. But one thing that I'm, I'm pretty uh, distinct about is um, CBSEM really lacks the, op like the opportunity to look into phenomena in a grand model. And this is where less comes in because it gives you the opportunity to explore very complex models with a limited amount of information. Um, then I think another valid argument um, is also the use of formatively specified measurement models. Um, we might disagree on whether this is a good measurement approach at all or not, yeah, but let's, let's just assume that um, we see merits in specifying measurement models formatively then seriously, there's very little reason to use uh, covariance based SEM because the method is puts heavy restrictions on our uh, on the way we can or how we can actually specify formative measurement models. Yeah, and finally, the causal predictive nature. Um, following up on what I said before, CBSEM is grossly unsuitable for that because uh, when you estimate uh, a model with covariance based SEM. Um, then the, the factor scores, the scores of the latent variables, they are actually uh, indeterminate. So they can have any value. It can be zero, can be 100, can be anything in between. You get the same estimates um, with an infinite number of different vectors of latent variable scores. And well, this complicates, obviously, <laughs> um, the assessment of a model's predictive power because if there's nothing you can predict, a score that is determinate, then, well, there's no prediction, right? And um, I think that's a severe problem in CBSEM. Uh, so I think there's room for PLS. I think it's just more practical uh, or more realistic and more practical view of co structure equation modeling. But I see the, the, the downsides of this. Yeah? And measurement theory, for example, assumption that you have composites versus factors. I understand this concern. Yeah? Um, but the thing is, is it really that severe? That's something that we try to answer uh, on multiple levels, like with our Nature Human Behavior publication and multivariate behavior research publications. We actually show that factor models are far from perfect. You know? And it basically casts doubt on the superiority of factor models as assumed by covariance based SEM. You know? So I think there are good, like theoretical, statistical arguments for. Uh, preferring the one method over the other. And um, I, I think Christian and my role are rather limited in that regard. <laughs> That's nice that you're saying uh, it. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. Now, my research um, primarily focuses on uh, personality um, psychology and that um, we use psychometrics um, heavily. And what I have personally found out is that um, there are lots of uh, issues and implications, serious implications um, when it comes um, to um, flaws in methodological issues. 
Now, replication crisis is one of the largest methodological criticism, especially in social sciences and um, hopefully in business research also. Uh, more than 70% of researchers um, have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments, and more than half have failed to reproduce their own experiments. Now, those are some of the telling figures that emerged from Nature's survey of 1,576 researchers who took a brief online questionnaire on rep reproducibility in research. Why is it so hard to replicate studies, especially when we are um, we have more computing power, we have uh, better ways of um, approaching data, including the PLS model itself. I mean, if it's so uh, bad in terms of results that 70% of researchers um, couldn't actually replicate other people's experiment, why do it in the first place? <laughs> uh, well, if, if that was actually the, the approach that scientists had taken, during the last decades, we'd still be living in, in caves and there would be no flying to the moon and no satellites, yeah? Uh, because if, if the first rockets fail, then let's stop doing it. I don't know, yeah? I don't think that's a good argument. I but, think in social sciences, the argument is a little different because that's, we don't have quantitative data all the time. And then we are trying to explain social phenomena, which is way more complex than um, medical science or let's say um, automobile um, industry or anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you gave the answer now. Um, we are looking at social phenomena, which are inherently difficult to predict and replicate because people are simply irrational. You know, I act the one way, today I act the one way, tomorrow I act another way. But there's a common core in me acting in a certain way. I think that is uh, reproducible. Um, but there's, I mean, the answer to that question is, I mean, we could talk about that probably for an hour or so, why this is happening now, but... Um, there are additional reasons that lead to this. Uh, journals asking for spectacular results, um, asking for significant results, um, not accepting papers which produce null results in many hypotheses. I think this is perpetuating the research practice of, uh, that we see and that's leading to uh, low replication scores across all the fields. I think it would be a better approach to take a step back and look into fundamental phenomena, try to replicate them using um, sound research design. And there are efforts like that. I mean, the, the study you cited is a good example, actually. It came out of the Many Labs project, which tries to like, link laboratories around the world, experimental labs, and try to replicate fundamental effects in social science research, including business research. So. I think that we need much more research like that. We need initiatives like many labs projects, uh, the Center for Open Science, for example, that tries to uh, make science more transparent. Um, I think we need much more of that. And we need to ask ourselves, why is this happening methodologically? And um, that's actually something we, we tackle in these two papers that I mentioned a second ago, like Nature and Human Behavior and Multivariate Behavior Research, psychometrica where we introduce a concept of measurement uncertainty uh, so when when we talk about measurements and you and you're from the field and psychometrics uh, we always talk about random and systematic error and uh, but if you take a look beyond the boundaries of psychometrics and look into meteorology which is the measurement of in of phenomena in the hard sciences they also have a um, element called measurement uncertainty which is um, different from random error. Yeah? Um, so you can have a measurement that is actually low on random error, but uncertainty can still be high because partly part of the problem is that thing that you seek to measure is actually moving targets. And this is nothing that we would accept in the social sciences because we just say, well, you know, if you just measure something with, let's say, several indicators, then you're uh, getting rid of the measurement error. And this is something that... Uh, physics researcher would neglect, you know? so at least partly, because there's still measurement uncertainty involved, and uh, we, we believe we need to take care of that. That's part of the key how we can solve the replication crisis. Um, and what would that require? Well, it would require that we be more transparent in what we do and how we do it, and also quantify the sources of error. That seems like a broad core, yeah? but I think that needs to be done. Um, 
it is inherently subjective to say, for example, I have a student sample, how does that limit my generalizability? Well, up to now, what we do, we just have a nice talk about that in the, in the limitation section, say, yeah, future research should use a non-student sample to generalize to a population. Yep, but that's true, that would be great, but I think what we should try really to do is um, quantify what does that mean for my result. If I only have a student sample and not like a representative sample of a larger population. Yeah? Um, so that's uh, what I would suggest that we do. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting. In one of my papers, um, I mentioned the fact that over 75% of research that we have um, uses undergraduate uh, be, um, students um, who we normally and jokingly mm -hmm. call the guinea pigs of research. Um, they mm -hmm. are the 75% people uh, who make up this research. But then there is another argument that they also represent the society that we live in. So oh. it's probably not that off. Uh, of our measurements. Um, now, I know for um, a fact that uh, you receive a lot of invitations to publish in um, uh, simply non-existing journals um, and uh, low or subpar uh, publications. Um, interestingly, there was a book um, it's called Fashionable Nonsense, uh, Postmodern Intellectuals Abuse of Science. It was first published in French in 1997, um, and it's by a physicist called Ellen Sokal and um, Jean Bricmont. Um, and as part of the so-called science wars, um, Sogol and Brickmo also criticized postmodernism in academia for the misuse of the scientific and mathematical concepts in populations uh, which have no scientific, uh, for example, issues like wage gap and quotas for underrepresented populations which have no scientific evidence. Um, they're more politically charged stances um, than facts. And then we also have uh, um, an experiment uh, by some physicists that I don't remember, it became a huge issue when they actually published in some uh, feminist journals, totally crap research. They took a uh, paragraph from a Mein Kampf actually, uh, and then rewrote it and then published that in a paper and got not only published in the paper, it got the best paper award out of that. Um, and that came out and it was a huge embarrassment for <laughs> the uh, feminist journals. Um, so. What do you have to say about the abuse of science in academia and so much uh, word orgasm rather than solid science? <laughs> nice word, word, word orgasm, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, see, um, science is also an industry, right? I mean, we have, we have journals be. <laughs> and, and we have publishers and we have lots of researchers who need, need to make a living and they, they cater to the system by doing what people expect them to do, publish in, I don't know, Scopus, SSCI journals, uh, not asking whether this is really relevant. Now, the thing is, in a perfect world, I totally agree with what you imply, yeah, that this is, shouldn't be like this. Yeah? So in a perfect world, Researchers should be out there and generally interested in the phenomena of interest. Um, they should be curious and only publish research that is relevant to society and um, whatever that is. I mean, then we already start discussing what's relevant. Yeah, is fundamental research relevant to society? I mean, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know until later, probably. But I acknowledge that there is something beyond this scientific idealism, which is um, institutions that um, need to educate people and these people that do the education also need to be researchers and they cater the system like in, a, in an automatic process yeah, with sometimes nonsense results. Um, so I'm not talking about these really nonsense results that are fabricated or so. I think this is uh, really harming the scientific endeavor. But I'm more talking about these studies that really nobody cares about and that you might see and then you ask yourself, okay, why should anyone read this here and be interested in that? I just accept that life is like that, yeah? but that's in, like in every part of uh, society, there's just areas where, where there's work done, which is really not adding too much to, to society and development. Yeah? So I think as long as, the majority of science uh, researchers around the globe follow this scientific ideal to really try to move 
mankind forward, so humankind forward, I think we are on a very good route, yeah? But you can't stop predatory publishers trying to hijack the scientific system. It's just practically impossible to, to get rid of these, yeah? And uh, I mean, yeah, in a perfect world, I fully agree that we all gone, yeah? No predatory journals, no uh, studies on, I don't know, some phenomenon that no one cares about, no hijacking of Mein Kampf to publish it in a feminist journal, yeah, as you noted. Yeah, but I, yeah, life isn't perfect, the world isn't perfect, so we have to live with that, yeah. Um, Marco, I wish um, the consequences of um, such bad practices were um, as innocuous as I just explained. Uh, Where's leading cause of death um, is misdiagnosis um, and um, discouraging of reporting negative results is partially to blame. So Ben Gold races uh, battling bad science dead talk. Um, it's been viewed 2.8 million views to date. Um, you um, and I have spent um, some time in academia and we know um, how it works and you've mentioned um, a lot of uh, shortcomings that we have. Um, I think it's about time that we discuss something to fix that. And I think um, not only as scientists, but as uh, people with conscience um, and some standards um, and want to able to leave um, a word that is good enough for our children, we need to do something about that. So how do you think that uh, we can battle against the bad science and university culture that I, as a professor, frankly, think promotes that? Um, how, how do you think that we should actually approach um, this um, issue, which has become a systemic issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're right. What, when I, um, in my previous response, I was referring to social science research, right? So uh, when it comes to medical research, where really life yeah? So we, I think we agree on that. Um, yeah, generally, I think we just need higher standards in, in academia. Um, Again, this is a, in a perfect world. What we would have is a much lower number of journals. Yeah, so the number of journals is increasing exponentially, and I think we need fewer journals which focus on more high qualitative research. Um, but what would that mean for the system? Yeah, we have more people being flooded into the system because universities not only expect their staff to teach but also to do research. So there's actually need for more research outlets, which is being. Um, well, promoted, uh, therefore we see more publishers coming in. And that's exactly the opposite of what I think is needed for science. I think we need fewer journals that, that focus on more fundamental effects. And uh, we need more rigorous review processes, um, which would mean that people simply publish less. Yeah? Um, and generally, I think that would be desirable. Yeah? Uh, so this is one way of tackling it. Um, the other way is uh, probably being more, more uh, strict about violations of, or not violations, but of any scientific misconduct, like fabricating data, um, not making the research process transparent. I think that's something that is urgently needed in all journals. I think all journal um, authors should be required to submit their original data along with the code and everything, yeah, to make the entire research pro process um, transparent. Uh, I mean, that's what, what we do in, in our research, but we haven't always done that either, yeah? I mean, back like 10 years ago, that wasn't a big topic to discuss, yeah? So we had uh, also um, proprietary data from companies which they didn't want to share. And to be honest, my, my view is if companies don't want to share this, then there's no publication, yeah? there's no research project, that's it, full stop. Yeah? And it's bad luck, then we can't um, understand several phenomena and people might bemoan that, researchers might bemoan this, but it's at the end of the day, if the research process is not transparent, then I think it should not be conducted. Yeah? So um, things like the OSF, um, Open Science Foundation, where you have, can pre-register your studies, you can, um, uh, you can, um, save the data sets in repositories. I think this is what should be mandatory for all journals. And if the journal does not comply to, to this, I think they should be considered predatory. Mm. Um, that's a nice response, actually. You know, all of my research that is up on um, OSF uh, with a different project, and I encourage my students to actually 
put out their data so that you know, people can actually help them uh, find out any of methodological um, issues in psychology. Now it's um, being encouraged to actually pre-register your studies um, so that uh, people can give you inputs on um, how it's um, going. Um, another problem, I think, um, if we um, take the responsibility off of the research and then put that on the um, university and the system. Um, I have um, done my master's um, from Sweden, um, where I have had a very good experience studying in Scandinavia. And you, I think, uh, went for the exchange to Finland, I believe. And I think we have some uh, very good insights uh, from the quality of research um, and output uh, from whole Scandinavia. Um, so one of the things that we can learn from that is not everyone is actually even um, qualified or smart enough to go to universities. I mean, I know for in Germany that there's a good system that you could write out, out from high school, you could go to uh, more of a Fachhochschule or some kind of vocational studies. And in Finland, 45% of people after high school um, do not go to universities and they choose something else. Um, from a personality psychology perspective, um, very few of the population is exactly meant to go to university in terms of the analytical capabilities that they um, possess. So now if every, it was so, if it, that was so easy for everyone to become great researchers, all of us would have been that and there were no cobblers or um, goldsmith or any other um, useful professions. So do, do you really think that you know, the recruitment process and the greed of universities um, for opening um, the programs for everyone has actually contributed to this tobacco? Mm, no, I, I, I would say so, no. I mean, there are examples like this, certainly, uh, and I'm actually aware of several in some countries where, um, where they're getting PhDs on board has become a business model for the... Uh, for the not happening on the grand scale about it, yeah. So I don't think that's actually uh, contributing that much. It's just differences in the education systems across the different countries. So like in Germany, we have the like an, an apprenticeship thing, yeah, where you don't have to go to university to work. Let's say I don't know at, at a bank, for example. Whereas if you want to work at a bank in the U.S., you have to go to college. Yeah, so it's just uh, different. Yeah, and the um, the rates, but the rates of like the population going to university vary by, between the countries because of the different systems. And, um, but nevertheless, we see certainly a trend of more people going into the universities, but I don't really think that tickles down to the, to the PhD or the researchers. I don't see, really see that. For sure not in Germany, uh, because we don't have any more. Yeah, of course not in Germany. Uh, so my question was actually geared toward the fact that, you know, if you um, single out these countries like Germany and Scandinavia, um, that... Okay put more emphasis on doing things that you actually want to do. So there are lots of um, personality psychology tests that you um, students in general take after they have graduated. So they take a gap year and think about what they want to do. And um, because finances and social mobilization is not connected to what they do in life. Um, in other countries, um, in more developing countries like Indonesia or Malaysia or subcontinent as a whole and America itself, um, you know, if you need to have a degree or a PhD to get to a certain position, I mean, you would do it no matter uh, what happens. And I don't think that's the best of the motives. Uh, no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> if you need that qualification and you just go through it, it's a very painful process, right? I mean, uh, because in, in the PhD, what do you, what do you actually show? Which, which skill do you actually show by having a PhD? Um, Many people would say, yeah, you're very smart, yeah, but I don't really think that. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there are many skills that you need to have in order to complete your PhD, like a certain degree of stubbornness, for example, and um, <laughs> also, also a bit of like, like being smart, yeah, sure, but also learning ability, the ability to question, to take, take feedback serious, also to question yourself, but not overly, and also the uh, ability to um, just cope with frustration. Yeah, I think that's a, one of the biggest uh, assets that you need to have for your PhD. So I, I think um, <laughs> if if this is something you you need to have the PhD to advance to a certain position and you go for it, yeah, um, then probably you you really want the job, yeah, <laughs> or you're <laughs> underestimating the pain you be going through over the over the years, yeah. 
um, and then it's fine with me. But I think these people are not going to produce research that is really moving the world forward. Yeah? So I agree with you. Um, the question is, do we really need this PhD requirements at least uh, now, even though you didn't ask for Germany, but I can tell you uh, in Germany, it used to be like that, that there were certain positions where you needed a PhD. And it's sometimes it's still like that, but that's actually, we are moving away from this. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the having a PhD as a kind of a ticket for a certain job uh, has been reduced drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, so it's actually counterproductive sometimes. You're overqualified. Yeah. And I see uh, yeah, I expect a uh, similar shift in, in those countries that you were just mentioning. That's true. Um, I think the recent moves by um, Google and Facebook and other companies that hire people without a degree as long as you know they possess um, excellent skills and talents um, is a good sign. And I hope that you know, that's going to happen in uh, social sciences anytime also. I mean, but let's um, leave university apart for a uh, while and uh, talk about something else. Uh, you are a co-founder of an IoT company, uh, I believe, called Infinite Devices, um, which got Google Cloud Start grant uh, with GCP credits. Uh, it was back in two May 2018. And I noticed there's an other co-founder with your last name. Um, can you tell us about the company? And is it a, like a family company or what is it about? <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting endeavor. It's uh, basically uh, originated from, um, from a, like a mess of, I've got to know a guy here, it's a friend of mine now um, that I met in uh, my hometown here. And um, he's actually a, a music producer um, and also a singer in a very popular uh, gothic band. So it's really not my type of music, but he's uh, what they call an ever black. Yeah? So it's kind of the uh, ever green gothic scene. He has a good friend who's a uh, was a programmer at um, Google and uh, Cloudera. And um, this guy, he had a, uh, a platform. Where he de started designing a platform, an IoT platform. And uh, Bruno, that's um, my friend saying he had, had saw the big potential in this. But he also saw, saw that there's an issue because financing is needed and marketing is needed. And so he asked me whether I wanted to join in. Um, because up to now, the, to that point, there was not really product, right? So there was, uh, we needed find financing. And I said, yeah, that's actually a, a great thing. And um, I'm going to join in. But we quickly noticed that in this type of business, there's lots of uncertainty regarding um, law issues, like contract law and so on. And fortunately, my wife, she's a lawyer. Yeah? So she, she uh, joined in. <laughs> so we are four co-founders co now uh, of that company. And working on this, yeah. But having said that, um, uh, I'm, I act as a CMO, like the acting CMO of that company. But um, this is really a, a side job because my main job is obviously a university professor teaching and research. And I can devote, uh, let's say, very limited time to this. Yeah? Um, it's a bit of a shame because the product's great. Yeah? Uh, it's an IoT platform which facilitates connectivity among IoT devices and it's like complies all, all privacy regulations in Europe, which is a problem now, it's full scalability with uh, too much tech talk, I guess, yeah. Um, but it's superb because it gives me the opportunity to, um, to work in practice um, and in an agile environment, which is not always the case at the university, as you know, yeah, at least German universities are very well, I'm slow in the decision processes, and this is the exact opposite. It's like a US type startup. Do it now, do it quick. Yeah, don't think about it for too long. And it's uh, the other extreme. Yeah, so in the universe, it's uh, lots of talking, lots of thinking, which is oftentimes a good thing to do. Yeah, but not always. Yeah, and on the other extreme, we have the company now, which is like, don't think, do it now. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of in the middle. It's okay. I guess the, the mean of those two jobs would be perfect. Yeah. And I think we are in the same shoes um, where I had to actually um, start the company because I was passionate about um, the idea. And then at the same time with academics, it's always such a pedantic talk. And it's kind of give me a vicarious pleasure to talk to someone who's, who's in the same shoes, which is very rare these days. Uh, let's talk about something uh, that I really admire about you is that not only have you um, excelled in 
your methodological research and publishing, but you have done a lot of work with um, huge companies like BMW and Alliance and Deutsche Telekom, as well as um, Hugo Boss. Um, so tell us, how is it actually uh, to work at uh, or work with Lufthansa and Volkswagen? Uh, well, it's fun, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> well, <it> depends. <laughs> yeah, generally it's fun. Yeah, uh, I mean, leaving leaving sometimes the politics aside, uh, it's uh, it's a great thing. Um, uh, especially coming in as like an external consultant, yeah. Then, well, obviously you can you have an outside position and can uh, take a different viewpoint on the processes and so on. Um, so I think that's that's a fantastic thing to do. It, like my research benefits from that and my uh, teaching particularly benefits from that also because I involve students in, in these projects if possible. But I don't run a, like a big consultancy on the side. Yeah. So just to make that clear, yeah, that these things happen, projects happen, but they are primarily done in cooperation with the university um, and with the students. Yeah. So for example, you mentioned Hugo Boss. Uh, that was a great project where we um, Hugo Boss gave us access to their database, um, uh, newsletter campaigns from a couple of months um, in four European countries, and the task was then to optimize the campaigns, like so which elements should be on top to maximize click-through rates and these types of things. So we, we had a project seminar with some 20 students, uh, which were divided into groups, and then they optimized the, the campaigns. Yeah? So this is something that is really uh, fun because I get insights to the company, I can work with students on some exciting projects, and we actually uh, try to solve a problem, a real world problem using the methods that we also teach. Um, by the way, that was not PLS, yeah, was something else. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and so it's a, it's a huge benefit for, for me. Yeah? So it's, it's fun, yeah. Okay. Um, Saina happens to be um, also a business partner with uh, Adobe and IBM and Microsoft um, in Pakistan. And then one other thing that I've noticed, um, and you can probably shed some light on that, uh, when you're working with these companies, um, the red tape and bureaucracy, I mean, you might not feel that you're coming from Germany, but then it's still a very different culture. Um, how did you actually deal with the cultural shock coming as a, uh, in as an external consultant and professor, which is always or already a black sheep? <laughs> I think that's just a matter of expectations. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty realistic and I'm also quite pragmatic when it comes to finding a solution. So I'm not a, when it comes to my research, I want things to be perfect, but when it comes to, um, to uh, consulting practitioners, I see that there are like internal requirements, yeah? um, like existing systems where this needs to be put into. We have certain, um, requirements from the managerial sites, which type of metrics to report and so on. And uh, so I'm quite pragmatic. Then I say, okay, given the boundaries that are set in this specific project, I try to do my best in uh, optimizing given the constraints that I have. Yeah, a good example would be work with a company which is super keen on the net promoter score, uh, which is like a single item metric to um, to assess like the, the recommendation behavior of your clients. It's highly popular in applied uh, in, in practice. So people just love it. Yeah? But my research deals with why this is really not a very good metric yeah? from a psychometric perspective. What are the implications of using such a metric compared to a better one in terms of predictive power and so on. And so basically my research univocally uh, concludes that never use this type of metric. But then I go to a company and the CMO says, well, you know, we have this marketing dashboard and the number one metric is net promoter score. Yeah? So there are way two ways of handling this. Yeah? So I can work with the current system and say, okay, acknowledging the limitations of this metric, I've tried to do my best to, to optimize the processes or I can just say, you need a different metric, yeah? And the latter is not gonna happen, yeah? N never gonna happen, yeah? Because they have been working with this and there's good reason to stick with this too. And uh, so, when, but you have to be a bit pragmatic there, yeah? So um, these are the, the politics that are sometimes in place, yeah? And the red tape kind of that you refer to. 
Yeah, um, I actually talked um, a couple of months ago um, with Josh Darmer, um, who's uh, probably the most uh, popular um, channel on um, YouTube about machine learning. Um, he's he spent a lot of time, thirteen years, um, in academia, and then he finally, you know, left to start his own company. Do you think yourself as at some point, you know, well enough of um, the publishing, and then you know, get to real work? <laughs> really work <laughs> at least in terms of the working hours i i doubt <laughs> that uh, <laughs> there would be much difference here um but no no i truly um, enjoy my academic work yeah i truly enjoy, enjoy working with students um i truly enjoy um doing research and helping other researchers around the globe uh, i don't think I'll, i'd be giving up on that no yeah um in case like this company, obviously that's uh, that's a question to ask. Yeah, uh, what if the company went up like a Google type thing yeah, and would be worth billions of euros? Uh, obviously, I might reconsider at some point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but generally, like as of now, and my just judging from what I do um, currently and my work, um, I'm I'm an academic. And that's going to stay like that. Okay. Uh, Margo, I think that's um, enough of your uh, work and um, what you have done. Let's get to the Margo without a last name. That means you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you as a person and not <laughs> the academic and the professor and consultant and um, a lot of your um, surnames. Uh, <laughs> The word has it that you have pristine tastes and hobbies. Uh, for example, the old vinyl records seem to be one of them. Um, how many do you actually own and what kind of music is on them? Yeah, actually, I looked it up because uh, when you ask um, prior to this interview, I was a bit unsure how many there are. And it's uh, it's uh, 300 um, vinyl records <clears throat> currently. And, um, well, the reason why... I <laughs> 40 years old, so when, when I was a kid, there were still vinyl records around, and uh, I actually worked as a as a DJ for a couple of years, um, making oh, nice. a living with this. Um, and um, yeah, that was actually a fun fun period. But um, yeah, <laughs> every every period has its uh, special specialties, right? Uh, most of the uh, vinyl records are actually on uh, electronic music. So I started with uh, really trance music, uh, very. Uh, like um, beats per minute are in the 160s to 70s so it's very quick yeah so 90s kind of techno trance music but today it's a bit more relaxed yeah so it's about 130 140 beats per minute it's very laid back um so the most recent record that i bought was actually uh, a german guy ben Böhmer. um you will know him but he's um it's like i think a ra rising star in the electronic scene and it's um very relaxed, yeah, it's melodic, it has vocals, uh, so it's kind of something that you can just listen while, I don't know, correcting tests, student tests, something like this, yeah. Calms you down, which sometimes... Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, you know, in my time in Germany, uh, um, I think there's a very vibrant punk rock scene. I mean, I used to um, love the Edste and then um, the Wojenstolz and a um, couple of others, uh, but mm -hmm. I think Time is changing, and um, I think your time was even uh, prior to me because I have never heard of this person that you just referred to. Yeah, um, well, maybe um, let me think. Is there anything else that you could? Uh, Paul Kalkbrenner, that's somebody that you could know. Oh, he is doing, he's a household name. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, Ben Boomer is, is similar to that. Yeah, it's uh, same. Uh, okay. I think Paul Kalkbrenner once came to my university, um, not my university, I was technically working in Ericsson in Stockholm and um, so it was kind of a student area where he had his concert um, and I couldn't sleep for two days because it was too loud. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I do have a clear, vivid memory of um, that. Um, you did your abitur from uh, Gothenburg. It's a small village near uh, Dortmund. And I think it wasn't too late after Berlin Wall. So how was those times as a young student and uh, possibly a DJ also? Uh, were you affected by the political situation? What can you recollect from your times in school? 
Uh, well, uh, regarding the political situation, uh, that was not really a topic, right? Because I was 10 years old when the, when the wall fell. So um, I just didn't understand what was going on. I just noticed that everyone was really happy about that. Uh, my, my mom was in politics back then, and so she, uh, she was super thrilled about this. Yeah? Um, and the, the eastern part of Germany, so for the ones that are now tuned in that don't know anything about the history of Germany, so we separated, right? So we had the east and the west, and there was a wall separating these uh, two areas, specifically Berlin area. And um, so the East was always like a mystery, not really something that you, you don't, didn't know very much about. Yeah? So, and now I live actually in the East. So it's, um, uh, it's interesting to see that it takes, uh, how long it actually takes until two areas like East and West that have been separated um, actually can grow together yeah so it's this is something that is striking as of today but during my time at the uh in school that wasn't really a big topic yeah um so i spent most of the time playing sports uh handball and doing stuff that teenagers do yeah um and then it was actually a bit more prevalent when i joined the army so in germany i had a that we had a um, army service there, which was mandatory back then. So I had to join the army for for about a year, and then this entire like uh, the east and the west conflict was still prevalent there. Yeah, because then, like then Russia and so on that was still a like a potential the enemy. Yeah, it's kind of strange by today's standards, but um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Very interesting, you know, um, one of my forays into Eastern Germany um, was certainly not very welcoming for some reason. Maybe I'm just way too brown for acceptable standards, but I certainly think it's a very beautiful um, place, especially Dresden um, mm -hmm. and uh, some other um, cities. Uh, I, for one, at some point in my life, wanted to study in Leipzig. Um, it's a great city, um, but certainly very competitive also. Um, talking about something um, of the physical word, um, it is very obvious uh, from watching Nobel Prize winners that in order to do something um, and you know have impactful and worthy research, you must be bald, old, and out of shape. Um, and you seem to be have broken this uh, stereotype, probably because you haven't won that. Uh, do you have a fat loss program for scientists who want to do valuable research? Um, I think you mentioned something about socializing effects on purchase behavior in one of your papers. Uh, do you think that people generally eat more when they're with company? Um, and does that mean that you uh, prefer to be alone? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not too sure about the research on eating habits in, in company. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there, I guess there are conflicting results too. Yeah, depends on whose company in you are. Yeah. So, um, but no, uh, no, I'm <laughs> I'm a very socializing person. I think. Yeah, uh, at least from my perspective. But. People might have a different view on that, <laughs> and you got to ask. Or maybe the people that. that you socialize with, they're you know very careful about their diet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just do a lot of sports. Yeah, so um, uh, I really I played handball for for quite a while, and um, do you still do it? What's that? Do you still play handball? No, no, no. The, the reason is that I'm uh, first off, I would break every bone in uh, in my me uh, if I tried to. Um, <laughs> And second, Why is that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe you don't know handball, but it's there's like a European handball and there's US handball. The, like the US type is like with a glove where you hit the ball. Yeah, the European handball is like a full contact sport, uh, oh, which boy. often comes with many injuries. Yeah, so you can just punch in YouTube or wherever and look for European handball. You'll see what I mean. So um, okay. I dislocated almost every of my uh, muscles uh, during those 13 years where I played uh, European handball. Uh, oh, so okay. this is very like lots of injuries that you get there. And I'm too old for that now, so forget it. No, I do long distance running actually. Um, and I uh, did that, I've done that since the army because at the army, well, what do you do? You get up in the middle of the night and you do, and walks, long walks and running. 
And I kind of like that, um, moving from the handball where you just have short sprints and then uh, into the long distance running. And I truly enjoy that. So we have got three kids um, here. And when the, the youngest one turned, let me think, two and a half, three, slept through. And ever since then, I started doing lots of sports again. Yeah. So before that, it was a bit difficult. But yeah, so I run about 50 kilometers a week and just enjoy it. Think about research and about, I don't know, whatever, life. Very enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that's a good lesson for um, scientists who want to become great researchers, you know, do long, long um, runs and, you know, that might actually keep you in shape. <laughs> now, you mentioned you, you're a father of two sons and a, and a daughter. Um, are, are they into science um, or do you see the spark and curiosity that um, generally you have? Uh well, they're too young, I guess. Um, a tiny bit, you can see it a tiny bit. So they're four, six, and eight years old. Um, my daughter's the eight-year-old. She's actually much into, um, she's very creative. Um, so she's doing acting and like musicals and dancing and so on. So she doesn't have that from me for sure. Uh, <laughs> um, the middle one, um, uh, he's, he's very uh, curious about things. So he does scientific experiments, but more like natural science where you can grow a crystal and or build a little rocket. And so, yeah, he's probably going to that direction. With the youngest, it's a bit difficult to tell. Four years, it's just un yeah, too that. young, I guess. Um, Marco, I have a lot of students. Um, they keep asking for advice about research. And um, one of my um, um, reason that I bring people like you on show is to actually give them a perspective because I certainly wouldn't call myself a great scientist, but you know, the people that I do call um, are certainly one of those and I want to have their advice um, to my students. So what do you think is the anatomy of a great scientist? I mean, how does he think? What bothers him? What makes him happy? What is he, how does he manage less curious society um, around him? And that sometimes people refer to it as uh, intellectual isolate, isolation and then ivory tower and a lot of other um, labeling things. But then that's also a fact in order to become creative. And, and there's plenty of evidence uh, for that from personality psychology that, you know, you are out of the box. Um, so how are these things interrelated and what is the recipe? Yeah, if I only knew, right? <laughs> if I only knew. <laughs> um, I don't think there's like a secret recipe to that. Yeah? There are some character traits which you have to have in order to, um, to grow in the scientific system. Yeah? And um, one of them being like the ability to take criticism and take it serious. And um, this is something that is pretty bewildering for people outside our discipline uh, or work field. Um, that type of criticism that you get and the harshness of the criticism that you don't take it personal. I think if you take criticism personal, that's not your cup of tea, you know, the, the scientific system. Um, the ability to reconsider a problem from different viewpoints and if you're stuck with a certain like a, a theory in your mind and you want things to work in a specific way the ability to take a step back and turn the problem around and see it from a different angle i think this is something that um a good scientific researcher can do and by the way something that practitioners like those that work at consultancies i think they're very good at that yeah so the ability to to take a different perspective and leave the beaten path and just say, okay, this is something we need to do differently now. So consultants typically do that. Yeah? I think this is something um, that like the personal characteristic traits that you have to have in order to be a good um, scientist. And truly, I think um, the, also this ability to experience flow while working, sitting at your desk and reading papers or working on papers. If you don't have that, then you're not going to be very happy in your job. Yeah. So this, what you refer to as isolation, I think in a, in, if you really want to be fantastic in your research, this is something you have to go through for a, a period of time. Yeah. Just dive into your research, dive into the problem and forget the outside world for a couple of weeks, couple of months, maybe even years. Yeah. And so, um, 
I think you can get your PhD without this, yeah, without the flow, but then you're not <laughs> going to be like a fantastic researcher or you're just a genius. I mean, that also happens, yeah, but generally uh, you really have to like dive into this, yeah, and ignore everything that's around you. And then um, everyone who experiences knows how energy consuming that is. Yeah? And um, that was something that I found so stressful about my PhD. Yeah? This, uh, this times when I was totally absorbed in my, my research. Yeah? This is something that you have to fancy in one or the other way. If not, then hmm, I don't know whether you're going to have so much fun. Um, yeah, but that's, that's about it, I think. Yeah? Curiosity and so on. I mean, that's clear. Yeah? You need to be curious about things. You have to appreciate the, the system you're working in, like any other system. You know, it has its rules and its boundaries, and you have to accept these. Um, and, well, changing them is very difficult. Yeah. And do you really think that um, your upbringing and family actually um, influences um, or um, corroborates these habits? I mean, what kind of childhood did you have? I mean, you had a good relationship with your parents who understood that need and uniqueness, uh, or, and did they encourage that? Or, you know, you're mostly fathers are more like harsh taskmasters. Um, <laughs> no, want no. Everything done. <laughs> no, no, very liberal. Like my, my childhood was like perfect. Yeah. My uh, parents, parents, took great care of me and um, facilitated everything like uh, me wanting to go to um, to live in the US for half a year during my high school time. Um, so they made that happen and that shaped me quite a bit. Yeah, and I think that contributed to very strongly to my character. Yeah? And also my, <coughs> my mom taking special care of me when it comes to um, like um, fiction, reading, um, uh, so she took me to the theater like every four weeks and i at the beginning i thought oh that's so boring yeah but after like a while i really love doing it and i still go to the theater today and I read lots of books um fiction books um not so much now currently with the kids but it's gotten a bit more difficult but generally that's something that i do and i will continue doing when i have a bit more something so i think jointly prepared me for the academic career. And by the way, that's a good point. I think a good academician should be able also to tell a story, yeah, to sell his ideas or her ideas. And um, reading novels is a good thing to train yourself for that. So um, that's at least what I do in PhD classes sometimes. I give students short stories to read and then understand the plots, how it develops builds up a climax and then there's a resolution after that and I think a good research paper is structured in the exact same way. Now it's almost sounds surrealistic um, but um, not everything uh, can possibly go good uh, for you in life and there has to be moments when you know you thought all right I'm done or you know there, there are situations when you think that you know uh, it's probably testing the limits of what you can take. Um, so I guess, you know, you must have some advice um, and um, hopefully an instance of how um, and what your problem was and how did you overcome and what did you actually learn from that that re was really helpful in your personal life? Well, yeah, I mean, there, obviously there are many such situations where uh, everything's full of doubts, yeah? So at least uh, in, in my academic career, the step from a postdoc to a full professor was one of these things, yeah. <clears throat> so because um, the German system is very unique in that respect, we don't have a system of associate professors on a large scale. You start your postdoc after finishing your doctorate and then you have six years to advance to full professorship. And during these six years you need to publish and network and all these things and then eventually you get, get a job. but there is a very limited amount of jobs because every university has one, maybe two marketing professors. And these jobs are occupied for some 20 to 25 years. So you can see the, the options in getting a job in these six year time frame are very limited. And that was certainly the most stressful time of my life. Yeah? So uh, it was really, sometimes was really feeling like hell yeah? because there was so immense pressure because if you don't make it, then after six years, you get kicked out of the system and you can't work at the university anymore. 
<coughs> so this is um, really a very unfortunate situation then and you go abroad or so if you haven't planned for that then um, that's not a great thing so coping strategies um, with that well <laughs> uh, try to take time and, uh, and do some other things in life and not being uh, totally absorbed in this and having good friends and uh, a loving uh, back then girlfriends uh, wife uh, that um, helps you through this. Um, so we got well when we get married. We get married right in the middle of this. Yeah. So really, when when I was in the middle of qualifying qualifying for the uh, full professorship, um, we got married. Yeah. So that was really <laughs> that really helped a lot. Yeah. Get something. Yeah. So I think the message is that if you um, are struggling to get a tenure, you're going to get married as quick as possible. <laughs> no, that's not, not the act of marrying, but having a, a loving girlfriend and after that wife yeah, who um, support you with this. Yeah? So if you see, the thing is, and that's a problem with, with many academics, when you talk to more sen senior academics, they tell you, um, don't wait. Yeah? Don't wait with family don't wait with taking your relationship seriously because there's a point when this is too late um because the, the problem in the academic system is there's you can always work more regardless of what you do there's always this big monster in the back research and obligations and admin and teaching and so there's you come home and well the the ability to just turn your research work off and your private life on very few people can do that Actually, I don't know anyone who's really very good at that. Yeah? And, um, but at some point you have to think about, okay, what's really important in life? Yeah? Is it for my job? For some it is, yeah? or is it like having a family? And then postponing this and postponing this all the time, you'll at some morning wake up and think, okay, that's it now. Yeah? So no family, uh, no relationship. Yeah? And I think that's... Um, if you focus back on the fundamental things in life, these are that really important. Yeah? I mean, who cares about my research? I mean, the most important thing in my life is my family. Full stop. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the pinching issues for a lot of academics, you know, um, who are into the system for way too long and um, probably way too old and, you know, kind of broke also because the system doesn't pay too much. I mean, in general, um, it doesn't. Um, have you ever considered, you know, relationship marketing courses for uh, academics also? Because there's a lot of scope in that. <laughs> Relate relationship marketing, like uh, uh, like relationship advice for uh, doctors or soon to be kicked out of the system um, candidates. So, what they should do if they get kicked out, or what do you mean? Well, for what I mean, if you take your own instance, you know, you had some uh, social support, uh, but I think there are so many other researchers who are in the same shoes uh, uh, and they certainly are in, in the position where they have to answer the question that you just posed that is it my research or is it my family? So that's they certainly can use your advice. Um, and I think that there's a huge market there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, but uh, I don't think I would be the right to cater that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Margo, it was an utter pleasure talking to you. Um, I think that's been the, probably the most um, revealing interview that you have had so far. Other than that, your, most of your interviews are focused on your work. Um, there was a very, um, you were kind of a mystery in terms of uh, the personal life. Um, and I think a lot of uh, other people get to know you personally, apart from your work and what you have done in your family. Uh, any last advice on um, how people should uh, approach their research, uh, managing personal life, or anything else that you want to add? Oh, <laughs> just have fun in life, that's all. Yeah? Whatever you, gives you fun, is it research, personal life, yeah? find a good balance. That's, uh, I think, the most important takeaway based on our last uh, discussions here. All right. I don't think there's a better advice than that if you're a PhD student. Thank you so much, uh, Marco, for being here. Um, I hope that we're going to be having uh, such sessions in future also. Um, and uh, once again, uh, it was an utter pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, thanks for your nice questions. Yeah, enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you so much.